So, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Bill Malkis here. Yeah, he was kind enough to come and give us a semester closing lecture, and he's going to talk about sphere packing. So, pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to you and to uh, Ephraim for inviting me here for this week. I'm it's my second time at MSU, actually. I was the third lecturer here. I don't know the exact number, 12 years ago, we did it in his. And then I spoke about error correcting code. So this is sort of the continuous analog. And there has been some news about this in the past couple of years that I will hopefully get to by the end of the presentation. So uh, even though there is recent news, uh, the question is quite old. I'll start by introducing it. It's so old that uh, it uses obsolete terminology. It would be called the ball packing problem if it were done, if it were invented these days. So uh, it, we're going to be concentrating on Euclidean packings of equal spheres. There is plenty of variations with other metrics and uh, uh, you know, packing of restricted parts of space and, and packing by things are the spheres. But it turns out that the sphere packing problem for Euclidean, the Euclidean sphere packing problem is a very natural and important uh, particular case. Of course, the case of dimensions 1, 2, and 3 are the easiest to visualize. We won't spend much time on 1 for reasons that will become obvious, but already in dimension 2 it's somewhat non-trivial. Um, going past dimension three uh, using laminated lattice, the, la the laminated lattice construction and other patterns that show up in higher dimensions. And then uh, everything I've mentioned so far is like 20th century and before. And the last two items are new. I mean, of course, Poisson summation is not new. Poisson is, I think, old enough to have his name emblazoned on the uh, Eiffel Tower, the rate of the right generation for that. Uh, but the use of Poisson summation to get bounds of sphere packings was basically my uh, thesis student, uh, Henry Cohn, and now I'm losing my, oh, here it is, Henry Cohn. And so, described those bounds. And then, uh, the very recent news of uh, Vyazovska who solved the sphere packing problem in dimension 8 and started toward in the story that solved the problem in dimension 24 and is likely to lead to an even more general result very soon. So, uh, as I mentioned during the introductory blur, uh, it's a classical enough question that predates our modern terminology. And the question is what's the largest volume fraction in Euclidean space r to the n? that can be covered by congruent non-overlapping balls, uh, traditionally non-overlapping spheres. This is a metric. Uh, so a ball with center and radius is given by the formula that we teach everybody in you know, metric topology. Um, it is, I'm using an open ball so that you're allowed to have overlaps, so to speak, at the boundaries. Balls are allowed to touch each other. Otherwise, I'd have to worry about coming with an epsilon. Uh, so if you want to pack closed balls, then you're allowed to kiss, but you're not allowed to, to, to be tangent, but you're not allowed to have positive volume over that. Uh, <coughs> fraction. Well, I mean, there is an infinite amount of space, and hopefully you're going to use infinitely many balls, and so the fraction is infinity over infinity. And so there is a limiting argument, there is a limiting procedure, of course, and you might imagine, okay, take a huge volume of space, see how many, how much of it you can fill with identical balls of a given radius, and let that go to infinity. Uh, it is intuitively clear, but also probably clear that it's very hard to prove, as I've stated here, that this limit actually exists. The trick to show it exists is to use not balls, big balls as your, uh, <coughs> as your volume that exhausts all of space, but big boxes. The reason being that boxes tile space perfectly. So if you imagine we're in dimension two, and I have a way of filling some fraction of this box with spheres, then 
except for if I remove all of those on the boundary, that's in the boundary, then I can reproduce this entire arbitrary large box with almost the same density. The difference, what happens with the boundary is an epsilon fraction. And once you have this idea, then you can easily show that this fraction as you let the radius of the box go to infinity approaches some limit. And once you know it for boxes, then you can approximate an arbitrary, an arbitrary other region, like big spheres or big pyramids or whatever, even if they don't have space, by boxes, and do it that way. Of course, that only shows the limit exists, because it's a Cauchy sequence or whatever, but it hasn't, doesn't tell you what the limit is, but that's an open problem for most values of n. Uh, because the present space has uh, scaling invariance, the choice of common radius is not going to matter. That's something that doesn't work anymore if you're thinking about packing the nested hyperbolic space. And in fact, in hyperbolic space, it's not even obvious that the fraction does not depend on the radius. In fact, it's obvious that the fraction is well defined. And so there are some tricky questions there which we'll be able to happily avoid. Uh, oops. Okay, so um, the final equivalence is that packing spheres, I mean, if you tell me the radius, if you then if you fix the radius, then the sphere is determined by the center. If you give me a bunch of centers in Euclidean space, they don't overlap if and only if any two of them are distance at most 2R. If for some reason you were here and actually remember my Phillips lecture from some years ago, this will be familiar because the same thing that arises in coding theory, you're trying to find a bunch of, you know, a collection of points, no two which are very close to each other, except this time we're using the Euclidean metric. And the density of the packing is proportional to the density in the usual sense of how many of them are there per unit volume of the collection of points. You just have to know the scaling ratio, which is, uh, the interesting part of it is the volume of the unit ball. Once you know the volume of the unit ball, you know the volume of the ball of radius r by just multiplying by r to the end. And the volume of the unit ball, um, I learned that from uh, Gallagher 30, 30 odd years ago, that the nice way to remember it is that the volume of the unit ball in dimension n is pi to the power n over 2 divided by pi, capital pi of n over 2, where capital pi would be uh, the, way that, the way that the gamma function was originally defined, that is to say it's n over 2 factorial interpolated by the gamma function. Um, so, if n is odd, there is a factor of square root of pi there, which conveniently cancels the square root of pi here, and so I work out the, how you get from this to the familiar 4 pi over 3 formula in dimension 3. And I leave the rest of the exercise. Once you go to dimensions 1 and 2, it's the usual, uh, it's the usual integration by parts, although there is a neat way to do it is the Dirichlet generalized to what we now call the Dirichlet integral. Uh, at any rate, so equivalently you have to give it the, the radius, maximize the center density, or give it the center density, maximize r. If you're going to pack a bunch of points into n-dimensional space, how far can you keep them away from each other? So these are all equivalent forms of the same question, thanks to fact that you're in space of scaling variance. So, why do we care? Well, I think it's a natural enough math question. Um, it sort of arises naturally from the structure of, you know, from the metric structure of Euclidean space. Uh, you can tell your introductory metric topology students that this is, uh, you know, making somehow uh, numerically quantitative, the question of, you know, how good an epsilon net can you have? Um, <coughs> but there are other, so one reason it's, it's a mathematically natural is that balls, unlike L1 or L infinity, uh, you know, Euclidean balls, unlike L1 or L infinity, have this huge symmetry group, 
there is the orthogonal group ON, in fact, the orthogonal group to get your translation. And, of course, the question about density is invariant under orthogonal transformation. And often, when you ask symmetrical questions in symmetrical spaces, the answers will sometimes have interesting symmetry groups. You know, the subgroup of ON that will preserve a packing will sometimes be of interest, of interest, and that happens in space for this question, at least for certain magical values of n. Uh, it arises elsewhere in mathematics, uh, so it's sort of the key ingredient in the Minkowski geometry of numbers, which is now coming back into the news thanks to the work of Manjo Barkova and his collaborators. Um, it's connected with quadratic forms. If you have a lattice packing, as we'll see, uh, as we'll see soon. And it also arises uh, you know, in the so-called real world, evidently so for n less than or equal 3, because it's a natural model for you know, everything from crystals to packing you know, more or less identical oranges, there were more or less identical ping-pong balls, uh, traditionally cannonballs. And uh, again, we're exploiting the fact that different radii, you know, be it an atomic radius or the radius of a cannonball, give rise to the mathematically equivalent problem. Uh, for n equals 1, there is not much to say, but for n equals 2, you get the hexagonal packing, which uh, I don't know about the birds, but the bees certainly seem to know about intuitively. <laughs> <laughs> and it might be less intuitive for n bigger than, than for n equals 4 or larger, but there are actual applications even for large values of n, for a while, uh, AT&T was saving a few fractions of a percent thanks to the existence of a particularly nice free pack in dimension 24, which I will get, get to, you know, if I can stop myself from doing too many digressions, because, uh, you know, you send some signal over a telephone, you send it digitally as a sequence of, you know, amplitudes, but if you can in, if you can, uh, instead of just each amplitude, you quantize at, give it, uh, at a given time and send about the quantized number there, that gives you some, some error. You do better by waiting until you have maybe 8 or 24 amplitudes, and then you quantize them all at once, and then instead of quantizing to the nearest integer point, you know, with all 8 or 24 coordinates integers, you can quantize to the nearest point in some other sphere packing. And then of course you have to, to figure out the uh, to figure out the closest lattice point, and that's an interesting problem in its own right. And that actually uh, it uses the physical fact that the you know errors the, the size of an error is measured by the sum of squares. So uh, the, so it's actually natural to use the Euclidean metric in this application of quantizing uh, a series of real amplitudes. And you might think a few fractions of a percent, well, given the amount of uh, traffic that was going down the phone lines, uh, that meant quite a few millions of dollars each year for AT&T. So uh, Neil Sloan more than paid for his uh, employment at AT&T uh, AT just with this one application. Um, so, as is often the case with these optimization problems, there is, we don't know the, the exact answer except in some dimension, in some special dimension. Uh, you get lower bounds by usually just by construction. They just say, well, here is a bunch of, you know, spheres, balls, whatever, that don't overlap, so the minimal fraction is, a, so the, the best fraction is at least this. And to prove other bounds, you need to prove some inequality. And if you're really lucky, well, first of all, if you're really unlucky, they are in the opposite <laughs> side, then you've made a mistake somewhere. Uh, most of the time, your upper bound is bigger than your lower bound, and so you know the actual answer is somewhere between them. And if you're really lucky, they, over, they, they agree, and then you have the exact answer, and that's when you tend to have you know, very special configurations that have, you know, large, highly regular, have nice symmetry groups, etc. Uh, 
So, what are the dimensions in which that happens? So, dimension one, as I hinted several times, is, is trivial. The reason is that the obvious upper bound is 100%. You cannot pack space more density than, than, than C1, but in dimension one, a ball is just an interval. And it's obvious that you can pack those uh, perfectly. So, dimension one, there's not much to say, although even there we will find that variations of the question are, you know, require some thought. Dimension two, it seems trivial, right? I mean, you, you are basically asking how, uh, you know, how densely you can pack pennies on the table. And we will show, I show a picture of a few slides hence, but you might think obviously you make triangles out of them. You can't do any better by bringing, I'm not going to draw the, the balls now, the, the circles, just the centers. You can't do any better by time, than by tiling the plane with equilateral triangles. And dimension two, you know, you can say that in a dimension, but dimension two you can actually tile the plane with equilateral triangles, so that must be the best possible. Uh, that was only given a completely rigorous proof about 75 years ago by Feish Thought. So with dimensions one and two we know, although two is very non-trivial, three is really non-trivial. Uh, that is basically Kepler's conjecture of 400 years ago, and it was finally settled, uh, you know, there were claims that by uh, Xiang a few years earlier, but Hale gave the first complete proof in 1998 with computer assistance. And as far as I know, there's still no proof of Hale's theorem that doesn't require some, you know, very non-trivial computer input. I mean, it's, it's about, it's basically, the computer has to, you know, split it up into a few thousand cases. Each one of them, there's some linear programming problem to solve. And in principle, you can have a human being you know, waste their entire graduate career checking all of these cases. <laughs> but uh, there, is no, there is no human comprehensible reason of why the answer should be that. Partly because, as we see, there are several, there's lots of similar but distinct uh, optimal configurations, which is not the case in dimension two. Yeah, you can always take out one of the pennies and the a symptotic density would be the same, but if you want a periodic configuration, this is the only thing you can do, or as I mentioned, three, certainly not the case. But just because there's a tiling doesn't mean that that's optimal, right? Oh, that's right. That's what I was getting yeah. at. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry I'm not clear about, if I'm not clear about this. Uh, this. This is a heuristic <coughs> argument. Yeah, you you cannot do any better. Right. But that is not a proof. You have to prove it. Yeah, you have to actually prove it, and that's what Feish Thoth did. Uh, and you can actually find in the literature before Feish thought claims with various degrees of certainty that it's obviously true that this is the case, but no actual proof that we will accept as such. But I mentioned three, you can't pack, I mean, a regular tetrahedra, and you can't pack regular synthesis in any dimension bigger than two. So there is a bound by Rogers saying that you can never do better than the local density of a of, uh, simplex, but you cannot attain that. That's one of the first non-trivial bounds. For large n, so we, we knew the dimensions 1, 2, and 3. For large n, it's not even clear what's the best, what's the right guess. So there's a very easy argument, which I might give towards the end if I have enough time, that says, you can't do, you can always pack in a, with the density at least 2 to the minus n. That's the minkowski kafka bound, and uh, it can, it's much more general than just Euclidean spheres. Uh, it's known that it has to be some exponential, you know, so something to the power minus n, except that the upper bound is 2 to the minus basically 3 fifths of n, plus lower order terms. So, uh, we don't even know that there is a limiting exponent, although it seems like an actual guess. Uh, but the, the, the gap between 2 to the minus n and 2 to the minus 3 fifths of n has essentially been with us now for uh, you know, more than a generation. The only slight improvements have been 
uh, you know, maybe instead of n to the one half, there is an n to the three half times log n or something like that. But no improvement in the main in the main factor. We do have plausible guesses going at least up to n. Uh, and they're all out of stacking, and they're actually very important in other fields of mathematics. So here's what they look like in dimensions one, two, and three. I mentioned dimension one already. Dimension two, one way to describe it is you take your one-dimensional balls, you put them in two-dimensional space, and make a two-dimensional ball around each center, and then you have an infinite array of these and you try to bring those as close as possible, bring the layers as close as possible together. And I've already shown you the first step what you need to do. You need to find the place in the end layer where the n minus first layer can go as deep as possible. It's a so-called hole. It's the point in the space that's as far as possible from any uh, field center. And so, you put them exactly in the holes, and that gives you one way of constructing the triangular packing. And naturally enough, it has some additional symmetries that we didn't have automatically sort of construct you. You can rotate 60 degrees, and it will be the same thing. And then, uh, you can repeat the procedure. So I mentioned the symmetry, sorry. Then you can repeat the procedure. Uh, blow them up into three dimensions. You have to imagine this because, well, we are in three-dimensional space, and our eyes are two-dimensional, yada, yada, yada. But there is a third, there's going to be another layer that comes down over this one. It's going to go over the holes. And you can see visually where the holes are. They are marked with crosses and pluses. They all look the same, but up to translation, the crosses and, star and, and the pluses are, are two different orbits. And then you stack them. And there are various pictures you can find online. I picked uh, one of them, uh, well, two of them from uh, pictures I found on the web. And in fact, they're both from uh, the article by Sam Neil Sloan that he wrote for Nature shortly after Thales' uh, proof was confirmed. And so you don't really have a choice about where the second layer goes because the crosses and pluses are equivalent, but having made a choice, the third layer, you have two choices that are, for which are different. You can either stack, right, so if you stack A, if you start with A, there is position B, like say the crosses and position C, the plus signs, and then you can go A, B, and its two possibilities are you can go above the A, or you can go above the C, so if you go A, B, A, B, A, B, that gives you one regular sequence. You can go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. That gives you another one. And there are more complicated things you can do. You can go A, B, A, C, A, B, A, C. You can you know, use some kind of the bond, you know, infinite the bond sequence that has no periodicity at all. And all of them have the same density. Uh, <coughs> so the one we'll usually work with is but so called face central cubic one, it's not obvious that there are any cubes in this construction, but if you go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, you get, as it turns out, it turns out to be the face central cubic one, and then you can keep doing this. Uh, and that gives you a lattice packing, which is to say that all of the spheres are equivalent under translation. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, an equivalent way of saying this is if you choose your coordinate system so that, never mind coordinates, you choose your origin for Euclidean space at one of the centers, you have a subgroup of Rn as the ball centers. So, in general, the lattice is the Z span, the integer Euclidean combinations of a real, of a real vector space basis for Euclidean space. Uh, and there are different choices of basis. So, for example, here is one choice of basis for the triangular lattice or the A2 lattice. It's, if you know already about refraction groups and league groups and so forth, then this would be a familiar kind of basis. But there are other bases, such as, sorry, I okay, might have to give you that one. If we choose this as your, third, as your second vector instead of this one, you get the G2 basis. <coughs> and, of course, there are many other things. 
Uh, lattice packings are a very special case. We don't know that for large n, lattice packings come anywhere near best possible, although the bounds I showed you before, the to the minus n, can be realized with lattice packings. Um, but in any case, not only are they specific or particular mass interest, again, they have quite a few symmetries, they're connected with quadratic forms. Also, even when the best packing known is not lattice, it's usually at least periodic. So you take a lattice and you take a finite number of translates. Uh, and it's not hard to show that periodic packings like this at least are within epsilon of optima. So in some sense, if you understand lattice packings, not lattice packing, so in a typo, then you can come to an epsilon of the best packing possible. And the best, the best packing is known are lattice packing up to and including dimension 9. Dimension 10, we think it's not. But in dimension 8, they are actually the same lattices that show up in the ADE game, the root lattices, the algebra, singularities, and algebraic geometry, etc. And one way to describe them is you have generators, all of which have the same norm fundamental roots of norm 2, and all the inner products, well, any inner product of root to itself is 2, otherwise they're either orthogonal or they have inner product minus 1, just like I showed you for A2. Right, so here the inner product is minus 1, so there's 120 degree angle. And you can form a graph saying the, the vertices are the roots, the edges are the pairs that are, that are not orthogonal to each other, so they have a minus one in a product. And if you just have a path of length n, that gives you the a n lattice. That's best possible for dimension one, two, and three. Uh, and within four lattices, by the way, we know the best lattice packings up to dimension eight, and here they are. Uh, then a4 turns out to be a bit worse than the default lattice. And in general, dn is the lattice you get from the integers from zn by taking every other uh, vector, let's say, all the vectors in zn whose coordinates sum to an even number. It's easy enough to see what the density of that is. All the distances are at least square root of 2. And so in general, the picture looks like you have a path of length 3, but instead of extending it, Instead of extending the path, you extend it at the middle vertex. And so in particular, if you just looked at it at D3, that would have been the same as A3. And that coincidence is connected with a <coughs> famous map from S4 to S3, which ultimately is what makes it possible to solve the quartic equation once they have the cubic, as once well a bunch of other pretty, pretty, pretty connections. Um, D4 has an extra symmetry that's clear from the picture because all three vertices of this propeller are the same. In our equivalent. That doesn't happen beyond that. That's connected with the unit quaternions. So there's all of this beautiful math that's connected with these small packets, with these uh, small lattices. Uh, all of these, by the way, are obtained by lamination. So the same procedure where you start from the last dimension n, find the holes in it, and put the, stick the dimension n plus, uh, stick the layers above the holes, and make dimension n plus 1. You keep doing that, you, you do that from three dimension as I showed you, you get D4, you laminate that, you get D5. You could continue to D6, but there is a deeper hole there, which gives you E6 and then E7. Those are the lattices you get here. And finally, the remarkable E8 lattice, which is by now over 118 years old, which has this, this Lincoln diagram. You can think about this as encoding the gram matrix, where you have twos in the diagonal and minus ones in a few places and zeros elsewhere, that there's the, the quadratic form. And one way to describe it is, remember D8, that's all of the integer, lad integer vectors with even sum in dimension 8. If you shift such a vector by the all one half vector, first of all, double that is 1, 1, 1, 1, etc. That has an even sum. Second, the norm of this vector and its distance from any vector in D8, or in fact any integer vector, is also at least 2. Because there are 8 coordinates, each one of whose squares is at least a quarter, and 8 times a quarter is 2. 
So the fact that these were optimal was shown for the mention up to three by Gauss, for the mention four and five by Korkin and Zolotarev a few decades later, and for the mentions up to eight by Blichfeld. Uh, and this result is already 80 some years old, and 80 years, eight, eight years and however many dozen generations of uh, uh, Moore's law later, we still don't know the answer for any good nine. There are guesses, but you can't prove their work. Uh, without the assumption of a lattice, of course, then the problem gets very hard even more quickly. Um, <coughs> not just for logical reasons, but also there's already an example in dimension 10 of a, uh, the best lattice known, to me, the best packing known is not the lattice packing. You look at all the vectors which are congruent mod 2 to one of these four vectors or one of their uh, cyclic translations. Turns out that all of them, cyclic rotations, all of them are a distance at least four from each other in the coding theory metric. And so all of the vectors are a distance at least two from each other. And there's more of them than we can we contain in any lattice that, that, that anybody has constructed. And of course, optimal lattices, even an optimal packing has many variations like the one I showed before of just taking out a ball or you can take out a few balls and then jiggle some of the ones locally. So we usually worry about uh, uh, only about what's called periodic uh, packing, but even those are much harder than analysis. Uh, okay, so they mentioned one and two I mentioned already. Uh, the best Pack, the triangular packing fraction for dimension 2 is just over 90%. It's this number, pi over the square root of 12, uh, basically because that's a fraction of an equilateral triangle that's covered by half of the relative <coughs> surface. I think I might even show that picture here. So the ratio of these... Uh, three pieces of slices to the entire triangle is root pi over 12, and therefore, pi over root 12, excuse me, and therefore that's the packing density. Uh, so Roger is the one who generalized this upper bound with uh, you can't do better than uh, uh, simplicity, but that is not attained. Uh, dimension three, the A3 packing uh, has this fraction, pi over three root two, which is just over 74%. That's not quite equal to the Rajan bound, and so that was Hales's theorem. And it actually is more complicated because there are local clusters that you cannot extend to infinite packing but seem to be trying to do a bit better than the 74 point something percent. And remember that there are infinitely many variations of the best packing that we know. Uh, I mentioned already there are two different choices. And somehow the, natu the natural world knows about this. So this is a picture of the periodic table which shows for each element uh, not just the usual information, which is like the atomic number and the, uh, and the chemical symbol, but also which, uh, <coughs> which uh, packing, when, it, when you make a solid out of it, that solid, you know, crystalline, it for, forms a, uh, and it forms a regular pattern in three-dimensional space, which packing is it? And so it's color coded here. There are some strange, there are some strange things that have to do more specifically with chemistry, like, uh, but ignoring those, uh, you can see that there are, there are all, there are several variations of uh, the status so A3 itself is uh, the FCC or ABC, ABC, ABC. Uh, that's the, that, that of course, for instance, for these two, calcium with FCC. Uh, a lot of them are the hexagonal cross packing, which is the non lattice packing ABABA. And there are a few elements that have this ABAC, ABAC with period four. And these are all the, the things that happen 
as close as to you know, room temperature standard conditions that they can get. It's a bit hard to get hydrogen to crystallize in uh, room temperature, so I don't know exactly what, what this entry means. But uh, there are transition temperatures. So if you heat an element or cool it enough, sometimes it will decide, oh, at this temperature I prefer to be in this lattice form, but in this temperature I prefer to rearrange this one. And it so happens that for cerium, which is in the title of this talk, it's the first of the, what they call the lanthanides, uh, if you look closely, it actually can't make up its mind. So there's a transition temperature very close to room temperature where it switches from the period four to the period, to the period three form, either FCC or the HCP. And anyhow, so that's just a bit of, a bit of <coughs> physics trivia. And, as far as I know, they don't yet know how to predict this from first principles. Uh, for example, if you go far enough in this in, oops, if you go far enough in these tables, uh, these are just guesses, and that only goes up to element 103. Uh, and they've gone up to element 118 now. And if you go on Wikipedia pages for the more most recently constructed elements, you have remarkably specific predictions about the chemistry of such of these elements they could be constructed, but nobody dares to guess how they would crystallize if they did. Uh, if I can think anybody has made such predictions. Okay, anyhow. Um, so, Roger famously quipped 60 years ago that every mathematician believes that the A3 lattice is best possible, or not like optimal, and every physicist knows it. But, uh, in fact, the proof is finally done in 98, as I mentioned earlier. And this was done with very careful consideration of local, uh, of, uh, you know, local configurations and how they fit together. And it seems quite unlikely that you could even do this in four dimensions where we expect the solution to be unique, let alone eight. Uh, so now, finally, I get to the 21st century, and to, okay, 2000 is not quite 21st century, but by the time the paper was published, it was. Uh, so, Henry Cohn observed that uh, you can actually get an non-trivial bound, which turns out to be the best possible in some, in, for some small values of n, uh, using Poisson summation. So Poisson, uh, okay, so he's certainly early enough to have had to have his name on the uh, on on the Eiffel Tower, and besides Poisson's summation, he is also credited with a quip that math is, life is good for only two things, which is to do math and to teach it. Uh, I don't uh, subscribe to that entirely, as we'll be able to hear tomorrow if you uh, go to the <laughs> concert effort, but it's a it's a better approximation than most people would give us credit for. Uh, okay, so what's Poisson summation? I'll introduce it with the following calculation. So one thing we also love to teach in first, you know, in a first or second course in calculus or statistics or what have you, is the Gaussian integral. That remarkably enough, the integral from over the entire real axis of u to minus x squared. We cannot do this by, you know, finding the indefinite integral and letting the variables go to infinity because the indefinite integral is not elementary. Yeah, it's the error function, but that's basically saying we give up. We don't know what we don't. We can't write it in elementary terms, but we need it, so we give it some name. But the integral over the entire real axis is exactly the square root of pi. Well, uh, I'm thinking. It's exactly the square root of pi, which is numerically 1.77 something. Actually, I needed to know this once. I uh, was crossing the border into Canada, where in going to a conference, uh, conference in Banff, what's about math? Oh, you're a mathematician. What's the square root of pi? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I'm not making this up. Fortunately, I, I did not have the presence of mind to think that to, to answer gamma over half, or God knows what would have happened. Uh, 1.77 something was good enough to get through the bid. Canadian security is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how do we approximate the integral? Well, we make a Riemann sum. So we choose some mesh delta, and you look at the sum over all 
uh, evaluations at multiples of delta. So sum of e to the minus delta m squared, so delta, which is the value at zero, plus twice delta e to the minus delta squared, four delta squared, nine delta squared, that converges really quickly. Uh, you need only some multiple of one over delta square, one over the square root of delta terms to get uh, n digits. So how close do we get? Well, let's try it. Let's take a very coarse mesh of one, and we get 1.7726. So it's already within, you know, a few parts in 10 to the fourth. It's already quite respectable. Do it with a mesh of one half, and all of these digits are right except the last one. <laughs> and we only need it to sum 12 terms. Uh, 12, it's really 24 terms, but I think it's 23 terms, but it's symmetrical. And the, the sum with mesh a quarter, there's no point in writing out digits, but the first one that's wrong is around the 68 digit. Uh, what's more, it's always, no matter how close it gets, an approximation from above. So, why is this happening? And the answer is Poisson summation. If you have any reasonable function, complex values on the real axis, f, you sum it over the integers, that's equal to the sum of the Fourier transform over the complex numbers. Excuse me, over, over the integers. The, the complex Fourier transform, but over the, summed again over the integers. And I'm normalizing the Fourier transform in this fashion, there is, where is it? Oh, there you are. In this fashion, so I'm putting the 2 pi i in the exponent. Uh, and if you want to sum over multiples of delta instead of over integers, well, you just use the function f of delta x, and you know what that does to the Fourier transform. It converts it to delta inverse times f hat of delta inverse. So delta times the sum of f of delta m equals, again, the sum over multiples of 1 over delta. Now, I don't know if we do it in the same class as the one where we prove e to the minus x, the integral of e to the minus x squared. E to the minus, that integral is the Fourier transform at 0. Of course, you set y equals 0 here. You just get the integral. But if you take f equals e to the minus x squared, the Fourier transform is basically e to the minus y squared, except for the factor of pi in the, new, in the exponent. And so that explains the observations. Right, so here, this is the, this is the uh, Riemann sum. Here, you have a term f hat of zero, which is the integral, and all of the other terms, where take k equals one, two, three, etc., they are positive, because this number here is positive, but they're really small, because e to the minus pi squared is small, let alone e to the minus pi over delta squared. So the Riemann sum exceeds the integral, but only barely. Okay, I've already addressed enough, so I'm not going to, if you want to take a picture of this before I go on. Um, <laughs> this is, you can do the same thing to, eva to, get to, to evaluate the data function at e even integers. Uh, what happens in n dimensions? Well, uh, the, the, the theorem, in fact, the proof generalizes once you know what Fourier series in n dimensions. So instead of delta times the one dimension, uh, excuse me, uh, Riemann sum, you have n-dimensional Riemann sums, and in terms of what we are looking at with lattices, delta m is the lattice in one dimension, delta inverse k, or the multiple of 1 over delta, is also a lattice, and it's a dual lattice. It's the set of all real numbers such that these numbers multiplied by anything here is an integer. So the generalization is L star, if L is a lattice, it's all the vectors with inner product with any lattice vector x is an integer. So if you've chosen a basis for already to make your lattice the integer multiples of that basis, then the dual lattice is the integer, mar the integer combinations, not the integer multiples, the integer combinations of the dual basis for which the matrix is the inverse transpose. So, for example, A2 star turns out to be equivalent to the lattice, uh, a, the, the same lattice with k by square root 3. Oops, where it were. So, the lattice centers are, of course, the centers of this ball, and it turns out these holes are 
the uh, together with the center is giving the dual f, which clearly is also triangular packing. You can imagine joining joining the poles of the two kinds to each other and to the center to get a triangular packing that's rotated by 30 or 90 degrees. E8 is its own dual. Uh, so the generalization is, uh, if you have any lattice, the, so I'm going to use the absolute value sign to mean either determinant, absolute value determinant to be generated matrix, or just the volume of the torus you get by taking R and modulo the lattice. And so equivalently, it's the sparsity. It's one over the density of the number of lattice points per unit volume, which is what you care about for sphere packing. And the theorem says, just like it was true here in one dimension, in general, this sparsity times the sum over the lattice equals the sum of f hat over the dual lattice. So that's a very useful thing, even in full lattice packing. For, for example, you can use that to show that uh, if you do the same kind of construction as before, sum over the lattice, e to the minus 2 pi i x, excuse me, e to the minus 2 pi times x squared, that's a modular form. And you can use that to, for example, count the number of vectors of a given norm in some of these lattices. Like for the E8 lattice, it's exactly 240 times the sum of the cubes of the factors of n. It gives you the count of vectors of norm 2n. And for more about that, see Sarah's uh, misleading titled course in arithmetic last chapter. Of course, this is using arithmetic in the classical sense of number theory. I first thought I spoke at a friend's uh, bookshelf when I was in high school and I was wondering why he was bothering the course in arithmetic, but <laughs> he's using number theory, like, you know, periodic numbers, quadratic forms, uh, and the number theory, etc. So, Henry's idea was this is a formula for L, for the sparsity of L. That's not how you'd expect to use it, although it turns out in retrospect there are precedents for it. And you get to choose f. And if you choose, so you have the test function to choose, and you want to choose your test function so that, well, first of all, uh, so assume that the, the radii have radius, uh, the, the spheres have radius r. Yeah, it's quite, quite clever. Uh, suppose that, first of all, f is always, f is positive at the origin, but negative outside this key radius of 2r, and the Fourier transform is positive for all x. Then, one of these sides, excuse me, one of these sides is an upper bound for f of 0, the other side is a lower bound for f hat of 0, and you find that the sparsity is at least f hat of 0 over f of 0. And so, that gives you a bound, and the reason that my, the time on the paper is not because I was the advisor of the thesis. I didn't, you know, he came up with lots of things before trying this, and I was not the one who came up with this either. I found that this generalizes as a bound in center density also to periodic sets. So that's why I'm on the paper as well. That and the fact that I was able to compute some examples. Uh, so the question now becomes, okay, what's a good F to use? So remember, it's these two conditions. In particular, we're actually going to do better than previous bounds, or we're just going to prove something silly like the sphere that pack density is at most two. Uh, so we need to find good F. And we're batting back and forth ideas on how to do it. In some sense, it's a linear programming problem, right? Because each one of these conditions is a linear inequality on some, linear, on some linear form in F, or it's you know, fully transformed a linear function in F but an infinite dimensional space. So we don't know how to do uh, linear programming in infinite dimensions, but we know how to do it in finite dimensions. And so one possibility I, that came to mind is, well, let's try Gaussian times low degree polynomials of absolute x. And that turns out to work quite well. So this is a graph of the same paper. It's normalized in some strange way, but ignoring the normalization, this is the dimension going from 0 to 36. This is the logarithm mod 2 of the bound translated by 
a factor that we, by, by a fudge factor that we found in Conway and Sloan's book. Uh, the jagged line shows the best free packings known, lattice or not. So this is a special packing dimension 24. This is the E8 lattice. You can't really see what's happening here, but A1, A2, and A3 are here somewhere. Uh, the upper line is the Rogers bound, which is the best known for small dimensions, especially 30 including up to 36. And the new bound is what we got using polynomials of degree up to 11. In particular, it seems that you do, that you were trying very hard to attain equality in dimension 8 and also in dimension 24, where there is an even more marvelous free packing due to Leach, whose symmetry groups were determined by Conway and basically account for half of the sporadic simple groups. So the Conway group is the automorphism group of the Leach lattice mod plus or minus 1, and natural parts of it account for everything going down to a few groups and several others. Now, if you're going to have equality in the bound, well, that means, remember, we have, this, is, this is the proof of the inequality, and so every time you have an x in the lattice that's not zero, this f of x has to be zero, and likewise, f hat of y has to be zero anytime y is in the dual lattice. So that's a lot of fourth zeros and double zeros that a function in the Fourier transform has to have. That's not too hard to do for one, for dimension one. For example, here is a function, dimension one, that proves the trivial bound, but we know it's best possible, that of 100% in dimension one. Uh, so I show you both the function in the Fourier transform. Uh, here's another possibility. Um, but in dimension bigger than one, it's not so easy. Because the rotation of symmetry, you can average over rotations and assume that a thing is perfectly symmetric. Uh, and so we know it has to be, in some sense, the limit of Gaussian times polynomial, but uh, the force zeros are very dense, even for the best packing you know, and nobody is able to construct such a thing. Now, since I'm running out of time, uh, I know I have 66 pages in total, but a lot of these are repeated, like this page is 1, 2, 3, so I don't remember the actual number of pages. Uh, turns out already functional is 3 are not going to get equality this way, just because of all of these different alternatives. You see, the equality condition has to hold for every optimal packing. And there are too many optimal packings in three dimensions, periodic packings in three dimensions. Uh, so basically, because of things like theorem, this is not going to give you the best bound dimension 3. We're not going to be able to prove health theorem this way. But we do seem to prove this in dimension 8 and 24. And, if, and we kept computing, OK, dimension 8 and 24 is easy. It looks interesting. Let's try higher and higher dimensions. And eventually, I, I, I'm not going to tell you more about the Leach lattice here, but this is a different thing that says it's uh, connected to the Conway group. This is a thing that's connected to some of my work, my work about more than veil analysis, but I'm certainly not going to talk about that here. And we kept getting closer, get closer and closer to the actual E8 and Leach uh, density. And later, with another student, Abhinav Kumar, they computed further, like they spent several months of Microsoft computing time, and they actually got within like one part in 10 to the 38. So it was almost certain that there exist these magic functions that prove the free packing density of E8 and Leach are optimal. And nobody knew how to prove them. And I kept giving, giving this talk. Uh, why am I going to have this here again? Uh, so I kept giving versions of this talk. At some point, Abhinav and uh, Henry proved using a version of this that comes with the to minus 30 at and for normal to degree 400. Uh, we're able to give a new proof of, that's somehow easier of Brickford's result about E8, but not E7 and E6. Where are you here? Uh, here. And they proved for the first time that the Leach lattice is the best lattice packing. And there were various experimental observations about the magic function. Everybody started calling it the magic function. That were made by Steve Miller. Like, the second derivative at zero seemed to be, seemed to be of interest. The first derivative at the packing rate it seemed to be of interest. And I was all ready to give another version of this talk at Tufts in the middle of 
in, in March, uh, late March of 2016, saying, okay, we still don't know what this magic function is. Somebody please help us. And then on Pi Day, not just any Pi Day, it was 3.14.16, so through to within four digits, uh, Marina Fyodorovska posts a, uh, a, a preprint to the archive, dated March 15th for some reason, but the post was made on the 14th. Uh, in this paper, it proves that no packing of unit balls in Euclidean space has density greater than that of the E8 lattice packing. And she found it by giving an explicit formula for this magic function. It matches our numerical calculations happily. And proving that it satisfies all the necessary properties. It's this amazing construction using modular forms, connected to but going quite a bit beyond what I mentioned before with the 240 times sum of cubes uh, formula. And starts, oh dear, I incorrect see there. This, con this construction starts with modular forms but adds some quasi-modular forms, some new counter integral traits that you know, simple enough that you can explain it to an advanced undergraduate, but, you know, it's amazing that it all works, fit together exactly, and uh, the formula is quite complicated, <laughs> so I'm not going to try to explain it here. Uh, that's just half the formula. There is one formula for F plus F hat, another for F minus F hat, and everything fits together great. It was published not long afterwards. Only a week later, somebody said once that doing math research is like, uh, groping around in a dark room, and as soon as you found the first light switch, besides seeing all of the wonderful structures there, you see all the other light switches. <laughs> so, that light switch also worked for Dimension 24. Uh, that happened only a week later, working with some of the same names we have seen before, uh, Henry Cohn, Abedev Kumar, Stephen Miller, who found some of these numerical observations that helped narrow the search, and Radchenko, who turned out to, have, to, to be the one who started uh, Vyazovska off in this direction, although he, he left off before she found the key idea in dimension 8, and he rejoined at that point. And so that proves automatically the uniqueness in dimension 24. And that may be the last dimension for which you ever solve the, the sphere packing problem exactly. Uh, so this, of course, made the news, the Scientific American article. Uh, and these techniques are already finding other uses. And there is a curious, uh, how far am I? Uh, there is a curious uh, gap here in what we know how to do. If you go back to that, if, if, I, if I go back to this, uh, sorry, I'm almost done. But if you go back to this graph, you can't exactly see what's happening here. But trust me that in dimension two, we seem to be hitting the exact uh, the, the exact A2 density as well. And that we haven't proven yet. You might think, who cares? We already know thanks to Fage taught the best pack in dimension 2. But there are other questions you can ask if instead of having points which refuse to come closer to each other in radius 2R but otherwise don't care how they move around, you can imagine charges that get more and more resistant to moving close to each other as they to, to coming closer to each other as they approach, instead of just having, you know, instead of having a, a, an energy function that has a vert, sharp vertical wall at twice the radius, you can imagine maybe Coulomb, uh, Coulomb repulsion, one over r, or one over r squared, depending on dimension, or some other uh, some other rule. And both uh, intuitively and experimentally, that's what this picture is showing, uh, it seems that the A2 lattice is optimal for essentially any such thing. We don't know how to prove that yet. Fage thought method does not work. Uh, we can do it for lattices, but not for arbitrary packings. Uh, in dimension 8 and 24, the same method should work. And I think any day now, uh, Vyazovska and Henry Korn are going to put out finally the, the I mean, they have, the, they have the magic function. It's the same kind of trick, except that you have to have a different inequality. But they have, they have found the function some, uh, some time ago, and it's hard to prove they're always positive where they should be, but that's 
going to be happening soon. It's numerically uh, unassailable. And uh, for dimension n1, for dimension 1 it's clear, but uh, for dimension 2, we don't know how to do it. Uh, so when I wrote uh, when I wrote this, it was true, and I think it's still true. They haven't officially proven that proven this for 24. They will soon, and then we still have the remaining puzzle of the magic functions in dimension two, where once we show them, we'll be able to actually you know, exhibit a uh, you know draw a picture which you can actually do in dimension 24. Okay, I'm sorry, I've gone over time, so this is the end at least for now, and uh, thanks again for staying with me. With the with boxes and then you yeah. let them expand, you, you have to you have to go along a discrete sequence, I guess, with the the box side to be n times r, or, or oh. a, a multiple bar, or, or or do you get you don't down have to because you, you, if you, you change the, the box, box yeah, if you yeah. change the box to n plus epsilon, you're clearly not going to change the, the answer by more than some article of epsilon or n minus epsilon or n, yeah. Better, yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so it's, you get bounds of the... Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Not, it's not an exercise maybe that you can write out that, the, the solution in five minutes, but it's, once you have this key, key inside, then it's, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. But yeah, you have, to, you have to worry a bit about how to deal with the fact that, as, it, as I've described to you, it's discrete, but in fact... Yeah. Okay. So two dimensions in boundary, you, when you have boundaries, you have uh, superconducting Vortices as you lower the temperature and you get these abris of, of yeah that's what I was showing here these are not actual particles they're like vortices they're those vortices, are more vortices right? rather yeah. than particles this is yeah. not, this is two D rather than three D right yeah it's, it's a, well it's a three D object but uh, yeah but, but vortices are are, are, are well, not are parallel yeah, they're not balls they're not balls they are they are two uh, lines yeah they're two <laughs> You know, is there a simple way to understand why 24 is special? Um, why is 24, for that matter, why is 8 special? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it has too many answers. It's one of these <laughs> things that I've read through an answer, for that matter, for which at some point you give up and say it's part of the mathematical universe, and we are, you know, we can give we can explain, you know, or the economic group for that matter, we can explain the written pieces of it, but the whole thing is, you know, just part of the way the mathematical universe is. One of the, one uh, explanation, I mean, from one point of view, it has to do, believe it or not, with the following fact. Uh, look at, there's a question about the light. I think I'll write, I'll write large enough. No, no, we got the switch over there. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so look at the group of, not the integers mod n, but the units mod n. So these are the numbers mod n that are relatively prime to n. It's a basic fact of number theory that if m is relatively prime to n, then you have a number 1 over m that if, say, there is some number x such that xm is congruent to 1 mod n, and x is unique mod n. So, uh, this, so, that, so that makes this a group, and you might ask, what's the exponent of that group? What's the smallest number such that you can raise any number to that power, you get back a, you get back a set. So it's exponent 1 only for n equals, n equals 1 and 2. Exponent 2 is special because that means that m is always the same as x. And that turns out to be a natural condition. We like, we, we, we like groups with, where the exponent is 2, for instance, because you can't make sign errors. But there are deeper reasons than that. And it turns out the condition there is that, right, so m, or equivalently m squared, is always equal to 1, or m is always equal, congruent to 1 over m, if and only if n is a factor of 24. Yeah. So for example, 
any square that's relatively prime to two and three is congruent to one, not just not just because it's an odd number, but it's an odd, it's a number one that's congruent to one mod eight, just by n being odd, and it's congruent to one mod twenty-four, just by n being odd and not one of three. And that condition arises naturally in some of the modular forms uh, uh, constructions. And so that, of course, you might then ask, well, why is 24 special and 80 special, but 12 is not? Well, 12 is special, but it's not quite as good as, <laughs> not quite as good as, you can, there, is a, there is a pretty, pretty nice pack in dimension 12, and there is a pretty nice pack in dimension 4, but they're not quite symmetrical enough for these methods to work. But, yeah, so that's, that's at least part of it. If you have seen, by the way, the pentagonal number identity, which is the one that says 1 minus q, 1 minus q squared, 1 minus q cubed, etc. If you expand this in the power series, it's a very sparse power series, and the numbers that appear in the exponent are usually described as being pentagonal numbers, but a better way of saying it is that if you multiply this by q to the power 124, then it's this times q to the 124. And what are the exponents you see there? There's something over 24. 1, 25, 49, 121, 169, uh, 269, uh, 361. These are the squares of the numbers that are relatively prime to 24, or equivalent to 6. So these squares appear already in the pentagonal number identity, which is like one of the basic, and when you put in the Q to 1 over 24, it's one of the basic modular forms that you use to construct the entire theory. So that's one connection where 24 arises naturally, and there are similar formulas for 8. There aren't really for 12. But it's a good question. I'm sorry I can't give a completely good answer. <laughs> Any more questions? Let's thank Professor